Hey folks, this is Mike Clark. You might be wondering what's inside Advanced Rails Recipes, so I thought I'd show you a few recipes in action. The book contains 84 ready-to-use recipes contributed by over 50 pros in the Rails community, including the Rails core team. Indeed, owning this community recipe book is like having some of the best Rails chefs sitting next to you when you code. And all the recipes were written and tested with Rails 2.0, so you know you'll be up to date. In fact, two recipes use features only found in Rails 2.1. Now, let's see what's inside. We organize the recipes in the book into these 13 categories. I'd like to show you a few of the recipes from each category. Rest and rounds are still largely misunderstood, but with these seven recipes, you'll have the confidence to move forward and take advantage of the benefits that they offer. Let's look at a few. If you've ever wondered how to handle single attribute updates but in a restful way, you're not alone. David Heinemeyer Hansen contributed this recipe, which is a slick way to just piggyback on your existing restful actions. Creating custom respond to formats for your application can clean up URLs and also provide some friendly pathways into the app. So maybe we're showing some MP3s, and a normal show view gives us HTML, but we've created an MP3 format. So if we just tack on mp3 to any mp3 file, it'll redirect to the URL and play the mp3. Or maybe we want to give folks the ability to get the entire playlist, all of our mp3s. So we tack on the .pls format we've defined, and that pops open iTunes on a Mac and opens the entire playlist. There are five recipes dealing directly with the database, but there's not a lot of eye candy here. So give these recipes a whirl on your own and see if your database isn't happier for it. Although not a book about web design, these eight recipes tackle some of the more common and advanced topics when it comes to user interface. Let's have a look at a few. Lots of people ask about multi-model forms. It can be tricky and there are some subtle design considerations you need to make, but Ryan Bates of Railscast wrote a comprehensive recipe on multi-model forms. So say we have a project model and we want to associate various tasks with that. So we'll just add three tasks in here we're going to do some yard work, we'll mow, we'll rake, and we'll clean. We'll submit those in our project. We have three tasks. Then we can come back over to the project again. We'll remove a couple of the tasks that we've worked off and submit that, and everything just works. After you've gone to the trouble of adding validations to your models, things like validates presence of, you can indeed actually use those inside of your forms to do inline form field validation. So if we have a valid email, we tab out of that, it says right on. If we don't give a password that's required, it tries to validate that against our existing validations, and we have to try again. Have you ever wanted to create one of those multi-step wizards that lets you transition using next and previous buttons? Here's one that lets you take quizzes. We'll just pick up where we left off. We've got short answer questions and true-false questions. These are implemented as single table inheritance, and we can transition between the questions using the next and the previous buttons. The cool thing is, all this is implemented using Access State Machine, so you can create the transition between your questions as simple or as complex as you need. On the surface, uploading images and attaching them to your model seems easy, but to do it right takes a bit more work. Thankfully, you don't have to go it alone because Rick Olson is the master and his recipe walks you through everything you need to know. So if we have an album model and we want to associate cover images with that, we can just upload a cover image, create that, the album gets uploaded into our server, the metadata is saved in the database, we have thumbnails and full-size images, and if we want to edit that album cover, we just come back to edit, choose a new cover, update it, Go back to our listing, we've got our thumbnail again, we've got our full-size images again, and to do that correctly takes a transaction to make sure all the models are saved in the right order and the validations gets run. So if you're doing file upload stuff, you definitely want to check out this recipe. Extend the reach of your web application by building a version optimized for the iPhone. Ben Smith shows you how. Search is a hot topic these days, and these six recipes help you get up and running fast, whether you're using Ferret, Sphinx, Solar, or an external search engine like Google. Let's have a look at Sphinx. Ben Smith wrote up a no-nonsense recipe on how to install, 
configure and integrate the Sphinx search engine into your Rails application using the Ultra Sphinx plugin. In his example, he loads a local copy of the Rails API into the database so you can search on things like validates. Or maybe you want to run a faceted search, all the validate methods that show up in the category of the API called module. You can hack together a Rails application in no time, but without a good design, you'll soon hit the wall. These five recipes help keep your code clean and expressive. Let's take a look at one. Both of these forms look the same. We've got standard text fields and labels and submit buttons, but underneath they're very different. In the first case, we use a form for and we have paragraph tags and labels and all the HTML gubbins in here. This isn't very dry and it makes it hard to change your form styles consistently across your site without doing a whole bunch of rework. In the second case, we've used a form builder. We don't see any of the paragraph tags or the labels. It's all built into the form helper, so there's one place to change all of your forms. And that's what a good form builder can do for you. No application is an island. and When it comes to integration, you want it to be as seamless as possible. Whether you're processing credit cards through a payment gateway, handling requests from Facebook, or using Google Maps to plot locations. Let's have a look at the Google Map example. Google Maps is all the rage. Imagine being able to geocode all the stuff in your database so folks can do things like find all the sushi restaurants within a 10 mile radius of their current location and plot them on a Google Map. All the cool kids hang out in the console. So the Air Free guys wrote five snack recipes to trick out your console so you fit in at the conferences. The fastest way to make your Rails application not scale is by trying to do too much work in a request response cycle. These three recipes let you take that work out of band using either the Starling message server, background DRB, or access state machine with a daemon process. Let's have a look at a couple of those now. One of the ways to schedule work to be run in the background and decouple parts of your system is to use a message queue. So one process pushes a message onto the queue and another process pops the message off the queue and runs the work in the background. For this recipe, we use the Starling message queue server. Say for example, we have albums. We want to upload some songs associated with those albums, but we don't want to wait around for Amazon S3 connection if we're going to put them on Amazon S3. Instead, we'd like the request to come back immediately and handle the upload in the background. So we'll just push a message onto the queue and then run a rig task later to consume the message and do the actual uploading. So if I choose a file here, and grab a song. That comes back very quickly, but then if we go back over and look at the queue itself, we'll run a rake task to consume that song message off the queue and do the upload to Amazon S3, and then it just continues waiting for more messages to show up on the queue, and away we go. Have you ever wanted to offload long-running tasks into the background and give the user a continuous update about what's going on? Well, with the background DRB recipe, you'll have it done in no time. So if we have some registrations we want to bill, but billing those registrations is going to take longer than we want in one Rails request cycle, we can just send them into background DRB and get a progress bar giving us an update as it goes. That's all there is to it. Email is one of those necessary evils of web applications. With these four recipes, you can send and receive email reliably. Of course, no recipe book would be complete without a healthy dose of testing. These 11 recipes go beyond what's built into Rails. Here, let's have a look at one. Need a cheap and easy way to generate a test coverage report? With a rake task and archive, you can have it in a jiffy. Whoops! Registrations are really important to our business. That might be a good place to start writing tests. Yes, indeed, Rails can scale, but if you're gunning for the big crowds, you're wise to do some caching and profile the results. These six recipes use memcache and other techniques to help you sleep at night. Let's have a look at one. Every once in a while, it would be nice to get some profiling information for a running application, even in production, and do it right from the browser. With a little bit of RubyProf and alias method chain, it's just a URL away to get all the profiling information in a nice table format inside of the browser. By following these three security recipes, 
you'll plug up some of the more common and yet often overlooked security holes. Let's have a look at one. If you're storing sensitive information in your database, you know, like social security numbers, addresses, and the like, you're wise to consider encrypting them with industrial strength encryption algorithm. At the same time, you want it all to be transparent from active record, so your dynamic finder should work on plain text, and you should be able to display the values of your attributes in plain text as well. It's easier than you might think. We'll create a patient record for Jane Doe and enter her social security number. Create that record, and then back over in our database, the social security number field has been encrypted, in this case using 128-bit AES encryption. But the cool thing is, back over in our Rails application, we're still just dealing with plain text, so it's all transparent from the application side of things. When it comes to deployment, the tricks of the trade have changed quite a bit in the last year. So here are a dozen recipes for a smoother landing. Let's look at one. If you need to take your application down for maintenance, it's polite to put up a maintenance page. That's pretty easy to do with Capistrano. But with a little help from ERB, you can customize the maintenance page as well. So if we disable our application using the standard task, we can get our own tricked out version of the maintenance page with a little bit of information to help folks out. Then when we're done with our work, we'll just enable the site again. And we're back in business. Inevitably, there were a few recipes that were too good not to include, but they just didn't fit in any of the other sections. So we called them big picture recipes. Giving users their own subdomain is a great one. Let's have a look at that. It seems all the cool sites let you create a subdomain with your name or your company in the URL. It's the vanity plate of the web, and Mike Mangino has the recipe. This book would not have been possible without all the contributions from talented Rails developers. Thank you all for taking the time to share your tips and tricks. All these recipes were extracted from real-world projects. In fact, the recipes I wrote came directly from building the new Pragmatic store. So it's only fitting that you can pick up a copy of Advanced Rails Recipes at pragprog.com. And while you're there, I hope you'll have a look around. Well, folks, thanks so much for giving me a few minutes to show you what's inside Advanced Rails Recipes. Enjoy!